a seven-year-old, uh, sorry, eleven-year-old Lucy Starnay Stallion, and I think you've had him for two years, Corinne, haven't you? And she's very kindly put herself forward as one of my guinea pigs this weekend. Um, he's quite a, I think he was a rescue horse, wasn't he, more or less in France? We sort of rescued him, and they've obviously been building up quite a nice partnership, but at the moment, um, just, uh, she's having lessons with um, Justine, um, who was a, one of the girls from Penlin Stud, and we're just building up her confidence. She's still not quite confident yet to canter, she says. We'll just see how it goes. Um, and what I want to do is just assess her first of all. I'm looking at her position. She is in a dressage saddle, but I can spot already that the saddle is tipping backwards. And that is the reason that her pelvis is tipping backwards and her lower leg is then slipping forward, so that if you were to whisk or go out from underneath her, she land on her backside instead of on her feet. So it's causing her lower leg to shoot forwards, and this is such a common thing, that saddles are literally fitted so that the saddle tips backwards and the rider's pelvis then tilts backwards, up comes the knees, and they can't maintain an upright pelvis. Last year I did a lecture demo for the BHS in Devon, and a girl came in, very short stirrups, and she had, um, I could see immediately her, her saddle was tipping backwards. Nice show horse, going very hollow, next show horse. And I literally took the, the girth off after getting her dismount. It must have been jacked up two inches at the back before the seat was level. Luckily, it had Velcro on knee rolls, so I could whack a nice big pair of knee rolls on, and put her skirts down five holes and the picture was enormously different in a very, very short space of time. And so, if the rider is sitting too much on the back of the saddle, they're going to be depressing the reflex point that either allows the horse's back to be raised or causes it to drop. And it will put her behind the movement in rising trot, I can almost guarantee. So, if you'd like to pop him up to rising trot when you're ready, Corinne. She's actually doing quite a good job there. She's a little bit upright and a little bit hollow in her back. And I would like to see her pelvis in a minute, just a little bit more forward. You've improved an awful lot since I saw those videos of you. I can tell already Justine's been working on her by the look of it. And she's improved a great deal already. But you can see again, her lower leg is really well forward. And I'm hoping that if we can jack the saddle up at the back, it will make a difference to her position. Her lower leg should then be able to come back more easily and he won't be quite so cramped at the back of the saddle. Just bring him back to walk a minute. Good boy. The only thing is I wouldn't advise normally jacking up the back of the saddle with a riser pad. All it does then is jam the front fork of the saddle down into the horse's withers and it will cause the horse over time to be sore. I'm only doing it today for a specific purpose to show you how much we should be able to alter your position. You would need to get the saddle balanced, have the, the front arch widened or get a saddle with a wider front arch potentially for him not to have the saddle then jamming down into his withers. So, if we could just have a little look at you in a sitting trot too. A dreaded sitting trot, she says. Lucy Tanner's are nice and easy to sit to in, in general. Right, okay, bring him back to the walk again. And you can see there that Corrine is bouncing quite a bit in the saddle because she's not using her back to absorb the movement of the horse. Basically, I'm just going to let her walk around again for a bit and talk to you about this all-important synchronisation of the movement with the back of the horse. If the rider is impeding the horse, then the horse is the one who will suffer. I was up at David Brooms a couple of years ago at the Wales of West doing a lecture demonstration, and a lady came in on a horse and he was creeping along a walk, and she was push up, push up, push up with the seat, and he crept along like this, Whack with the whip, thump with the legs, and then she asked if she could try one of my saddles, which are of course a, a soft tree saddle, which gives great freedom to the shoulders. So we put the saddle on, 
Then I showed her how to use her legs with the swing of the belly to encourage him to walk forwards rather than pushing with her feet. He immediately slowed out. She turned to me and she said, what's he doing? I said, he's walking. <laughs> and she said, this must be some other pace. I said, no, this is walk. She was a very novice rider. She'd only been riding for three years, had the ex-riding school horse basically for two years. But as soon as she stopped pushing with her seat, he could then start to walk out. And it's something you see people all the time, they push with the seat. What we're doing, and we'll have a look at that in a minute, because we'll show how we actually use a closing of the seat in a downward transition. But when you're doing that all the time, you're stopping your horse. So what happens, you see it in riding schools all the time, sad to say, and you'll see when the rider's pushed with the seat and the horse is still stopped, then they kick. So what happens, what I can do at lecture demonstrations, but I'm not sure we've got enough room here to do it at the moment, is to get the audience to actually hit their rib cage the way they would a horse. So you see them sort of, you know, I say, bump your rib cage the way that people kick a horse. And you then hear a groan go up to the audience then I'll ask them to monitor what the rib cage is doing, because the rib cage then goes stiff. And if the horse's rib cage goes stiff, he can't swing it. If he can't swing his rib cage, he can't step under with his hind legs. So what happens then? They resort to the whip. And the horse is screaming, I cannot go forwards. And that's basically what it boils down to, is the fact the rider is stopping the horse from going forwards. He's doing his level best to try to walk forwards, but he can't do it. And so, Kareem, I just want to bring you in a minute. Um, I'm going to pop that saddle off and try and jack it up a bit at the back and see what's going on. He's tending rather to overbend. Do you normally ride him in a pelham or a snaffle? Do you normally ride him in a pelham or a snaffle? Right, okay. Well, I love the pelham bit in general, but if a horse has been ridden over bent in a, in a, um, a double, which he could well have been uh, abroad before he came over here, then sometimes the snaffle is the better option. But on the other hand, for today, in a, a different environment, it's probably better that she's got him in something that she has a little bit more control. But the pelham shouldn't normally used to be, um, be used for control but in order just purely to get the horse to relax his lower jaw. And we'll have a look at that later on. But for now, I just want to jack this saddle up at the back. So if you can hop off, we have actually got a little mountain block that I've brought in in case. Naughty girl, didn't take her foot out of the stirrup. Right, now if I undo the girth here, this is another thing too, folks. If you have a dressage saddle, always make sure that you have a long enough dressage girth because if the dressage girth is too short, which a lot of people do use them too short, the, butt, the elbow can come back and hit the buckle. Or I've even known a horse being brought down by it. So always make sure your girth is at least as long as Kareem's here, so that you're not going to end up with the horse injuring himself on the buckles. So, ah, there's an Isabel there at the saddle, so it will have the stirrup bars further back at least. That's good. Um, but, you see, that saddle is now much more level. I've just jacked it up that bit at the back here. And, oh, you have got Velcro knee rolls, even better. Right, okay. Um, I'm just going to go and get something to shove under the back of that. So I said we wouldn't normally do this, but we need to get it sitting level. So I'm just going to use a memory foam, it's actually a wither pad because I haven't got a riser pad with me. But having seen the saddle briefer this morning, I could see that it was actually tipping backwards. And we'll just shove that under there for a the moment. And then we'll just grab that girth again, green. And do it up. And then what I'm going to do is also to move the knee rolls further back to support her thigh. This is why I don't like saddles with the big knee rolls on the top on a dressage saddle. If you've got them built in, it doesn't adjust the rider's thigh shape. Velcro on knee rolls are a much better idea because it means then you can place them, for instance, somebody with very large thighs, it can tip them on their fork. 
anybody with very, very thin thighs, it can tip them back on the pelvis again, make them want to bring the knees up. So you're much better off having um, knee rolls or knee blocks that you can actually move. So you're going to be all right with the Velcro. Oh, you good boy. Right, I'm just going to move that back a bit. We have ways of getting you in position. Let's move this one back too. Let's see what we've done here. Let's see if it's made a difference. You want to do that step up, that's the third one, the way that you normally do, Corinne. Yeah, okay. Good boy. It's remarkably good. Has he ever done anything like this before? He's never even done a show together before, so isn't he good? Yeah. And he's an in, he's entire, he's standing. So, I can just pop you back on board again. And for anybody that knows their Lusitanos, he's pure Vega, which the Ve Vega is a bullfighting horse, so they're generally quite hot. Okay, it'll take a minute just to squash down a bit. Yep, got you. She's nice and light. Right, let's just have a look and see if we've managed to improve that position at all. <coughs> Sit more in the middle, and then bring your toe directly underneath your knee. So that is basically how we want to get you sitting. But because she has a tendency to have a hollow back, now just sit, sit a little taller. That's it. She, we don't want her to over hollow this area here. If you find somebody has too hollow a back, we'll turn you around in a minute so the others can see. Just take your feet out of the stirrups a minute. Bring your knees up over the top of the saddle. Now slide your butt forward a little bit in the saddle and then drop the knee and thigh down again. And you'll find then that you find the deepest, most central part of the saddle. Okay and try not to round the back, just sit up tall but without hollowing it. So we want a flat back, very much as you would have in Pilates, for instance. But when you look down, you shouldn't be able to see your toe over the top of your knee. Okay, so let's just bring that leg back a little bit further there and walk on again. I'm just going to take this out of the way. Okay, walk on. And just see if you can maintain that position now that the saddle's jacked up at the back a little bit more. Sorry, I should have turned you round again. Can you just turn round for the other audience down there, Corinne? Come in a little bit further and try to keep that lower leg further back. Okay, turn in here so we can just show the audience trying to keep your elbows softly by your side too and the lower leg back so the toe is directly underneath the knee, which is not now rolling the pelvis backwards. Okay, walk on again. Just make sure you've got your reins the right way around. Oops. Okay, one way up. That's it. Top one up, side bottom. Right. Now, I just want you to show us how we can use our weight aids, for instance, to turn the horse. So I want you to ride it on as loose a rein as you dare at this point in time. And just watch that lower leg is still wanting to slide forward again. Just bring the lower leg back a little bit more. That's it. Lovely walk. And when you want to turn, I want you to turn to the right in a minute. And just show me what you'd normally do. Sorry, that's the left, but never mind. Okay, so what would you normally do to turn? Right, now... You're turning your body so that you're collapsing your inside hip quite a bit. Most people will teach you to turn your body so that you're parallel with the horse's shoulders and parallel with the horse's hips. My old trainer, Captain Desimaron, he trained with Nuno Oliveira in Portugal. And Nuno, or Desi taught us what Nuno did, not necessarily what he said. And how Desi taught us was to advance their inside hips so that you're looking in the direction in which you're going. It also has the effect of bringing your outside hip back so you can use your leg from the hip right the way down to your heel. What will so often happen when somebody tells you to turn your body to the inside is you collapse your inside hip. The outside hip has now gone forward and you use the leg up from the knee like that. If you advance your inside hip, 
Just try that now, Corrine, just without bringing your right shoulder forward. Keep the reins fairly loose, and I want you just to press a little bit with your right leg behind the girth, and look in the direction in which you're going. Lower leg back, lower leg back, left leg back, left leg back, and bring further back, good girl. That's it. And then turn left again, fairly sharply. Just look a little bit left, not too extreme when you look. Just as you would if you were on foot. Try and do everything as much on a horse as you do on foot in the same way. Just bring your right shoulder slightly back, back, not forwards. Now turn right, just look slightly right, look right. Left leg back a little bit, keep your hands together. Inside hip forward, it's like you're going to point your hip in the direction in which you want to go. Just look right and advance your inside hip a little bit. And you'll find that all horses will do this. I mean, I'll, in a minute I'll probably hop on him and just show you pretty much what I would do. And he does do a bit of lateral work, doesn't he? Does a, some shoulder in and leg in and things? Yeah, okay. Now, when you want to halt, what do you normally do to halt? Okay. Now, my German train trainer taught us to actually close our seat muscles slightly, which arrests the movement underneath you, but it also lifts and lightens your seat at the same time. So if you walk him on for a minute, okay, good boy, lower leg back again if you can, bring that toe further back, okay. Now when you want to hold, I want you to bring your leg further back still and just squeeze your bum together. Sit tall and just squeeze with your seat but try not to collapse your back. What you're tending to do there was to round your ribcage a little bit. But bring your toes back so that you're sitting up tall and you can very slightly hollow your back at this point. Okay, walk on again. And this is the aid we use in all downward transitions, whereby we close our seat. You can close your seat strongly for canter to halt, slightly less for canter to walk, and slightly less still for canter to trot. It has the effect of keeping your buttock muscles in contact with the a good boy and square. Good boy. And it has the effect of keeping your buttock muscles in contact with the saddle, but it's lightening your seat because it's lifting your skeleton. And you'll hear some instructors say to sit more deeply through a transition. Most people tend to think about sitting more heavily. And so you're wanting the horse to raise his back underneath you, not drop it. And so by lightening your seat, it has the effect of making you grow tall as you close your seat, and it also arrests the movement underneath you. You keep the leg on, good girl. There you go. And walk on again. Now, the other thing I find so few people are taught is how to use their legs correctly. And I'll say to them, I remember I was up at Kelly Marks a couple of years ago doing her horse psychology course with Kelly's good friend. Um, and she put us all in groups and she said, how do you get the horse in front of the leg? So I asked the other members of my group, well, you just use more leg. Yeah, but how do you use more leg? Well, you... I said, right, now try and do that with both legs together. And needless to say, they would have ended up on their nose. Instead, and again, I'm very controversial when I teach this, but it works. It works every time. And if you actually think instead, because you'll hear some instructors, again, ask you to pull your thigh muscle up, particularly as ladies with rounder thighs. They will ask you to pull your thigh muscle out, which that then turns your knees in like that. So it forces your lower leg away from the horse's sides. And where I come from in Devon, horses are definitely not that shape. They tend to be much more that shape. <laughs> and if you're actually pulling the thigh out, as a friend of mine said, what do you do in rising trot then? Go hoik, hoik, hoik in rising trot to try and keep the thigh muscle out behind. Instead, if you think of just slightly lowering your little toe, you'll find that it will enable you to use your leg with a slight inwards and forwards roll of the calf muscle, and you won't even see the leg being used. And that, for me, also helps to engage the abdominal muscles of the horse, it helps to lift the rib cage, and it will produce a very quiet, very still leg. So what I'd like to see you doing, when you, with him, obviously, you're not having to use very much leg at all, Technically, if the horse is, as we say, in front of the leg, it means the horse responds instantly to your aid, not five seconds or ten seconds later. I know I wouldn't be here now. I was out on a big x-ray horse 
uh, about 16 years ago in our village with our deep dugout dead lanes. And a school bus, a single decker bus, came ripping around the corner, absolutely nowhere to go. And only for the fact that my horse instantly leg yielded two steps into the tiny little pull-in, my spirit scraped the bus the whole way down the side, but I'm alive today. And I know that if he hadn't been in front of the leg, I wouldn't be alive now. So schooling is not about making horses look pretty, it's not about going in to, make, to win a better dressage test, but making your horse safe and more pleasant to ride. So let's just have a look at, at the moment, Corinne's legs are very good. Although her leg was a bit too far forward, she's not busy with her legs. And I have a feeling that with Orgo, that she would disappear fairly quickly if she was a bit busy with her legs. But when you go to ask him up to rising trot again, just think of very slightly lowering your little toe as you close your leg. So there's no backward movement of the leg at all. There's no backward kick. So when you're ready, pop up to rising trot again. And just slow him down a little bit by slowing your rise and sit. Good girl, that's it. Lower leg back, Corinne, lower leg back. Try to bring that toe further back still. And what I, yeah, if you stay a little bit more forward, it will help your lower leg to come back. If you rise too upright, you'll come down on the back of that saddle. I want you deliberately now, just to see what happens. Lean well back, and you see immediately his head come up. And he's now started to slow down. If you do that on one of my Lusitanos, they'll stop, literally. So lean slightly more forward, lower leg back. And when you want to come back to walk, Corinne, think of just slowing your rise and sit. So you slow your rise and sit. No, don't go sitting. Stay in rising. And just come slower with your seat back to the saddle. So you almost have to make him sort of catch you down, slow and slow. And try and do it right the way through to the last beat of trot. This is so much easier to do for novice riders. Instead of going rising trot, and then suddenly coming too upright, possibly, and go plonk in the saddle. The horse then does a rather rough transition, and consequently, you'll find that if you do this the way I was taught in Germany, in actual fact, just by slowing your eyes and sit, lower legs back again, really have to try to work to keep these lower legs back, because you'll find then that you'll be in much better balance, okay? So bring that toe still further back if you can, and up you go to rising trot again. And let's see if we can keep him slow. It'll take a little on the rein if you need to, just by closing your fingers. And then when you want to bring him back, just slow your descent. You just changed onto the wrong diagonal there. Okay, and yeah, and walk. And you see, pick up the swing of the belly with your legs as you walk through. You'll get a much more forward transition so the horse will stay round and soft throughout the transition. And again. Just slow down a little bit. And then slowly your bum coming back to the saddle and slow, slower still and slow and walk. You've got to be careful with the horse as sharp as him. You don't use too much leg and end up going back to trot. So once more, let's have a change of the range, shall we? Lower leg back. What I would do with Corrine if I had her at home for the sitting trot is to put her on my horse movement simulators because on that I can show her the precise movements of the lower back and pelvis in order to be able to absorb the sitting trot. Pop up the rising trot again, no legs back. The movement we should be making in walk on a horse is exactly the same as our pelvis makes on foot. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four so that the pelvis is literally just as we would be walking on foot. In sitting trot, it should be one, two, one, two, one, two. So your seat bones are actually separating and rising and falling with the two sides of the horse's back. Your lower back should very slightly flex and straighten as well, because by doing that, it's absorbing the up and down movement of the horse's stride. But the reason why so many people can't feel which hind leg's coming under, which hind leg's striking off the ground, when the shoulder's coming back, when the shoulder's going forward, is because their backside is not actually 
adhering to the horse in the correct way and not synchronizing with the two sides of the back. Basically, the horse has two sides to his back. You have two sides to your butt. If you put two and two together in sync, you make one. Put two and two together out of sync, and you make a bit of a mess. But, okay, just change the diagonal again. And walk. So in the sitting trot, the movement is exactly the same as we make when we run on foot. So it's one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Not, as you'll see so many riders doing, and that's where the nodding head comes from, because they're driving with both seat bands fall together, and so the movement comes out through the shoulders instead of the lower back. So if they're doing that, you'll see the hands will go up and down as well, head nods, but you'll also see the lower leg doing that. As soon as you get the rider absorbing the movement through the two sides of the um, back here, so that the seat bands are rising and falling separately, then the legs will just do that with the swing of the belly. The hands will stay still. And that makes a big difference to how your horse can perform. In canter, the movement is exactly the same as you make when you skip on foot. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, not need to find changes, look. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the movement that you make. So what you'll see a lot of people doing is this. Polish the saddle, they're taught. What's your horse's back trying to do? Every stride of canter should be like a jump. And if the rider is actually not absorbing the movement correctly, and they're pushing down with the seat, polishing the saddle against the back that's trying to come up, then they're going to depress it and flatten the canter. And the further you get up the ladder in dressage, and you're trying to do tempi flying changes and things, the more you need the horse to have that jump in the canter to get the expression. So, in the sitting trot, what I would actually do with Corrine would be preferably not on a horse as hot as him at this point in time. Have her on a schoolmaster horse after we've put her on the simulator. The simulator we used to have here every year, and I used to get so exhausted trying to work people's backs on it for two whole days. It's even worse in Germany at the Epitana, it was nine days over there. And what we actually do is stand behind the machine and show the rider the precise movements of the lower back and pelvis. So that, for instance, when Corinne's walking around here, she's walking um, using her pelvis nicely with the two sides of all goes back. And when her left seat bone drops down, for instance, down, 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 that's all goes left hind leg coming under the body. And also the left shoulder coming back. So if we were able to go up to sitting trot, which at the moment I think we would have to work on quite a bit to get that sitting trot because he's sharp and hot. His stride is quite short and she's finding it quite difficult to sit to. What we would be doing <laughs> would be to do lots and lots of transitions. Only six or eight strides of sitting trot. This is something you can do yourself if you're, you're finding it too bouncy underneath you. It's just to do six or eight strides, back to walk, a couple of strides, six or eight strides, back to walk, and gradually build it up so you can do eight to 10 strides, 10 to 12 strides, and build it up in increments like that because you'll find that the quality of the trot stays higher as well when you do lots of transitions. So we will be looking at a few strides of sitting trot here. Just trying to do a few strides there and then bring it straight back to walk and walk. But because you can see what's happening, Corrine's immediately bracing her back against him. And this is where a horse like this who's so hot is not the easiest one for her to learn to sit to the trot. Even though he's actually got a very easy trot to sit to, I have a feeling, if it was a big moving warm blood, 